Welcome to Uncomfortable Conversations about Culture and Christianity. My name is Eric, and today I'm joined by Jess. Hello, world. And Alex. Hello, county. You're just greeting the county. <laughs> just which county? Sarpy? County. Yeah. Which Douglas one? is Douglas? the current county is that, we're that, that, in, that we yeah. are in. Mm. Maybe you're not in Douglas County. Let us know what county you're listening to. I live in a fun one to say. Potawatomi? Potawatomi. Potawatomi County? Yeah, Potawatomi. Oh. Potawatomi? No, Potawatomi. What are you? <laughs> Man. Uh, tongue twister. County yeah. name. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's a good one. Iowa. That's where, Iowa. That's, that's where I'm at. How are you guys doing? Is everything okay? Hanging in. Are you, I'm are loving you? this cooler weather. Like the weather. Oh, We're having you, versus like the hundreds. I'm not going to allow you to just hijack this podcast to talk about the weather, Jess. <laughs> that is the. That you I mean, said, you, how are we doing? And I'm I know, ha- but that's, that's always the like the, I'm that's the like go-to. Like, I don't have anything interesting to say and I'm uncomfortable talking to you right now. So I'm going to talk about the weather. <laughs> I was looking for, I thought we were closer than that. You know, like, when I say, how are you doing? I don't expect I'm doing weather well. Trauma. I process more of my childhood trauma with my therapist this week. Type okay. Thing. Yeah, that's <laughs> oh, okay. good. That's better. That's good. <laughs> I'm great. Got here safely. I'm, you know, I'm hopeful. I had a rough couple weekends. Okay. Do tell Huskers. us more about that. Yeah. Oh. Husker, oh. <laughs> <laughs> We're like, oh, it's, it's deep. It's been rough. No. It's been tough. But I'm I'm excited because we, someone graciously gave us some tickets. We had some extra tickets. Ooh. And we have a neighbor boy that's never been to a game. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I talked to my son. I'm like, hey, we should invite him to the game. And my son is like so, I mean, he was so excited to invite this kid. And like the, his reaction, like it was like you've, you told the kid he's going to Disney World. I mean, he is like the most excited kid in the world. So I'm 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 going tomorrow to the game and just so excited to watch like this kid. Yeah. Like our neighbor kid just see yeah. everything. You know, like we're gonna go early and watch like the team walk in mm-hmm. and the unity walk and just like mm, go to camp. Sweet. So like I'm looking forward more than like the game is like the anticipation of watching like and how my son interacts with him. So yeah. I'm hopeful. That's cool. And it's a night game. So maybe we'll, we'll see Matt rules first, first game. My last game I took my son to, he saw Scott Frost last game. So oh. hoping, mm-hmm. hoping for better things. Yeah. Do you get emotional about, about things like that? I would like seeing someone experience something that I care about oh, yeah. and just having joy. I would, mm-hmm. yeah, it's going to be I fun would get to watch. Some, yeah. It's going to be fun to watch that. Tears. So. Eric, have you ever been to a, a Husker game? One time. Okay. One time, yeah, it was. Uh, uh, Christina won. Uh, what is it? Sweet tickets oh, or wow. something like through her work years ago, Ooh. and we got like the whole executive treatment with the food and everything wow. up there. Got to sit up there. It was it was very fun, and that was when I actually like kind of converted to caring a little bit about the Huskers, and it's kind of fun. You really. Cause I, I was always kind of, I wasn't anti Huskers, but I just didn't really care. And then I was like, oh, okay. I kind of get what this is all about now, you know, being in the stadium. And, uh, but that was it one time. I think it would be fun if the three of us went to a Husker game together. Definitely. I don't have, I mean, it'd be well up to one of our listeners just putting it out there. And okay. Austin, I will Austin, say, just give us tickets. We'll go to Alex. Always, always looking it for has us. Been, I don't think I've, I think I was 18. For, oh, it's been a while. So That's it's been a while. That's. 20 years. Oh, ew. What? That's a long time. Yeah, 20 years. You dated yourself. <laughs> I did. How old is Jess? Everyone do the math. Uh, and add a year. So she's almost 48, <laughs> mm-hmm. is according. To no, really? 48, 18. <laughs> I'm, I'm actually, math. you'd have to add a year. It's I called feel, pastor math. Okay. <laughs> pastor, don't do apply pastor math to people's age. Pastor math, I'd be like five, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 10, 15 <laughs> you'd years. You'd be older. Methuselah at this point. Uh, this week is is uh, a week we don't have a voicemail. No. We had a few people that, for whatever reason, and I think it's fine if yeah. you're like, hey, I don't want to hear my voice on yeah. the, on air or whatever, then they sent us some text messages. So this person gave us eight options. Wow. Very generous. Oh, wow. That's a lot of text Outrageously messages. generous. So they <laughs> uh-huh. must be a CCC member. It's beyond belief. Beyond belief. And uh, Jess, I'm going to... We're not going to go through all these. I want you okay. to pick a number between one and eight, and I'm going to read that question mm-hmm. uh, as our kind okay. of banter. Can I include Eric in this a little bit? How? Because I want to pick two numbers, and then you pick one. 
I want to pick and three and five. Them all together. No, I'm going to pick three and five, and you pick three or five. Yeah. Oh, I have to pick okay. three or five. Yeah. Oh wow! Wait, look how inclusive you are. Uh, I'm going to go with five because I like five. that round number. Why do they say it's round? Okay. Because like, can you hold your hand out? It's like all right, a here we go. I'm Sorry. I'm nervous a little bit, and you're pre-reading it. Stop. I'm reading it right now. He's, you're thinking of an answer. The question here is: if you could go back in time mm -hmm. and kill Hitler, what? <laughs> Are you serious? Would you? Yes, Would, that would is I? the question. <laughs> <laughs> That's the question. Wait, are we talking baby Hitler or are we talking adult Hitler? Oh. Because I think that's, I mean, that's the thing. People are like, well, I'd go back when I it was like a this, like, baby. Like, like, this like out a... of all of these questions, they, most of them are like <laughs> of very I... like, I feel like tame. And then this one's like one of the worst <laughs> Alex humans to ever live. Hoping we didn't say five. I'm Anything but five. Like we could have gone with is a hot dog a sandwich nope, or nope, a taco those, salad, but those. instead we're talking I, about I think, yeah, hmm. something it a lot does more serious. I mean, that raises like moral issues, you know, even if it's an extremely evil person, like would yeah. you do it? I would say if you went back and listened to a little bit of our Aliens Exist episode with Minister Mark Ashton, we talk a little bit about time travel and interdimensional things mm -hmm. and how that plays out. And I just think that, you know, the whole time travel narrative, if it if it is as we hear in like science fiction and things like that, like actually killing Hitler might not change things for the better or for the worse. You know what I mean? Like, I think we we have this idea that we, that would actually change something or make something better. But... <laughs> You yes, don't really I would know. kill Hitler. You would? I think. Okay. You would just, you. that's your only choice is like go back and not like go back and save Hitler, like convert him to Christianity. Make him. The only, I mean, a just believer. based on this question, yes. I mean, and that's assuming, you know, okay, I killed Hitler and he, you know, oh my goodness. what happened? No, I'm just saying like no, I'm that just, the Nazis, you yeah. know, don't come into power and that, like for me, it's like, okay. Yeah, but that millions what, of lives are saved. I mean, now we're now in you're in, now you answered this, and I'm sorry you stuck your foot in it, but I got to ask because like it, we did not clarify the timeline. Like if you went back, and like he's in a high chair being fed by his mother, and you're looking at the small child, and you're here, Mister Gun Ho, wow. I'm yeah. here to Probably kill Hitler. Like I think that I'm people sweating. don't really think this question I'm through sweating. because this is really a dark thing to take a human's life, even the most evil of humans. No, it's still it, it like a true. heavy, like a heavy thing. I don't know. Oh, I think it would be tough to like. I is, is he true. fully assimilated into this like evil person, or is he not there yet? Like I think that's what is it? Can you change his trajectory? Yeah, maybe? and I'm thinking like. The guy has risen to power. Two finger and mustache. I'm able to, <laughs> yeah, and I'm able, yeah, like to end his reign. Okay, got you. That's that's kind of my not not child <laughs> yeah. baby. Well, I'm just say, I just I I agree. It's, like, it is tough. It is to, a subjective question. Yeah. you know that leaves a lot of. Mm -hmm. Um, but without thinking Nuance. about it too much, like the first answer question that popped in my mind was, yes. Oh. <laughs> Excuse me, I feel some anxiety yeah, because sweaty. I just I can, recently I watched, listened to a podcast where the guy that went and killed Osama bin Laden, yeah. like goes through all the things that happen. Mm -hmm. I don't think I could. I don't think I could kill somebody, mm -hmm. but I could do do it with the team. <laughs> you're like, like you'd be there cheering them on. Like, I'd have to kill I, Hitler, yeah, or kill something. Hitler. It'd have to okay. be strategic. Yeah. And also, this is an interesting question to process through. There's this documentary called Spy Ops on Netflix right now, and it goes through the beginning um, when 9-11 happened and yeah. all the things that were happening before and after. And it kind of helps. I don't know. That's why I'm saying this, because these people work as teams. I don't mm -hmm. think I could go alone and make that decision, but I could process it with a group and do it. And that just maybe is the type of person I'm, I am, yeah. even from letting you pick that's, Two numbers, yeah. like, and I led us we, to this. I'm sorry, I apologize. Great. So, I, yeah, I would, uh, I would go back in time and uh, bring him a podcast, uh, and I'd say, hey, I'd give it to his mom, and I'd say, listen to Dr. Sylvia AC, uh, producer Austin's mom, talk about how to build a strong family, and maybe some of that would uh, help 
uh, develop young Hitler into a better person and build a stronger family. That's my answer. I'm sticking to it, but I think I think we're going to move on <laughs> from this. Thanks, everybody, for joining in for that part of the show. Uh, but like I'm I mentioned, sweating. Dr. Sylvia AC will be joining us to talk about building stronger families. All right, today on the show, we are joined by Dr. Sylvia AC. Uh, thank you for joining us. And we're going to be talking about building strong families. So I, I'd i love if you could just give us a little bit of insight into who you are, um, maybe a little bit about you and your family and your career and what makes you, I don't know if we'd call it, if you consider yourself an expert on this topic or at least something you have dealt with for many years uh, and have a lot of insight on. So if you don't mind, introduce yourself a little bit. Mm -hmm. Well, I like to say that I know a lot about families because I have a family of my own. And uh, so I've been married for 47 years and have three grown sons, three wonderful daughter-in-laws and eight grandchildren. Oh. Wow. So I have a lot of experience right there. Um, but I have been a professor at the University of Nebraska Kearney for 30 years. Uh, during that time, my go-to class was marriage and family relationships. So I've also taught uh, cross-cultural family patterns and families in crisis. And uh, the students in our department are preparing for family services. So that's kind of where that context comes from. But marriage and family at UNK is a general studies class. So lots of students took that class. And... Uh, I'm also a researcher, as all professors must be, and so I uh, concentrated on family studies in post-communist countries. Okay, and, wow. And then I've done some premarital preparation uh, for about 24 years, so that's kind of who I am. So there's a little bit of experience there. I'd a little say. bit. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm retired now, so okay. I, I say my main job now is to be grandma. Yeah, all right. <laughs> That's an important job, and it still, in, you know, involves family. Yeah. At least from what I understand, sometimes uh, probably more work or uh, time. Could be more, <laughs> more tiring work. days sometimes. <laughs> and just for all of those dying to know, mm. um, you are our lovely producer. I have never called him lovely. Now you just yeah. the mother of our lovely producer, Austin. So I'm curious. He, I know he went to UNK. Mm -hmm. Did he take your class? He did. Ooh. Uh, can you tell us, like, how did he do? <laughs> well, he says he always got a B, but oh. I don't know. I didn't look it up. <laughs> okay. Okay. Wow. Got a B in the, in the mom's class. All right. That's good to know. Yeah. Good to know. So I think one of the things that you've talked about and we'll probably go through throughout this conversation is that there's six qualities basically that have been found out of, uh, and if I butcher any of this, you, that's when you can come in and fix all my mistakes, but of quality, quality of strong families. And so researchers have identified this. It's I think cross cultural across the world, mm -hmm. uh, different cultures. And so, um, just curious, maybe what are those six qualities and what kind of research went into kind of figuring this out and like how confident are we okay. that these six are good? Okay. Well, the six qualities are commitment to the family, positive communication, enjoyable time together, uh, showing appreciation and affection, the ability to handle stress or crisis uh, effectively, and spiritual well-being. Those mm -hmm. are the six. So just a little bit of the history of how this all came about. In about 1970-something, there were three uh, professors from different universities that began to look at all the research that was being done about families, and it was mostly focused on negatives. You know, what's mm -hmm. wrong with the family? How can we fix the family? And they were more interested in focusing on what's right with the family and taking it from that standpoint. So... Uh, they developed uh, an inventory that was used uh, for, well, at this point, we have more than 20,000 family members that have been wow. uh, interviewed or they've taken the inventory. Um, besides that quantitative interview or uh, inventory, we've, we've developed more of a qualitative interview uh, that gets a little bit more in-depth. Mm. And... Um, after a while, uh, people started doing this, replicating this study across the world, and 
at this point, there's around 30 countries that have been studied. Um, and what we found is that there, uh, people around the world and families around the world are more similar than they are different. And they're uh, in agreement with those six qualities. Yeah, it's fascinating. Wow. So can you share some specific examples of how commitment plays a crucial role in building and maintaining strong uh, family relationships? Well, commitment has a lot to do with people's um, uh, dependability, their uh, trust in each other, and maybe some faithfulness is part of it. It's, it's really an ongoing uh, commitment to staying together, to working together, no matter what happens. That, mm-hmm. That's what commitment is. Yeah. So how does that, I'm just curious, how that plays out in the life of a family if, you know, parents don't really have that commitment. So like as a, as a pastor, you know, a lot of times I end up having some counseling appointments with people mm-hmm. that have been married for a long time and didn't really understand the commitment. And now, you know, four or five years later, we're trying to understand that commitment. Mm-hmm. But we've got kids in the in the issue or not the issue, but kids in, in the marriage now. And some of their commitment is really not even towards one another, but it's towards we just want to stay together for the sake of the kids, yeah. you know. And so how does mm-hmm. that foundation of beginning, you know, the beginning stages of a marriage or even if it's not a marriage, you know, uh, whoever mother and father that are producing that family, how does that play a significant role in just the bedrock of how a family even begins, I guess? Mm-hmm. Well, it, it's really interesting how kids will pick up on what's going on in the family. It, they don't need to tell them that there's no commitment there. They can see that. And so um, beginning, you know, it, even after marriage has occurred or that relationship has occurred, making sure the kids understand what that commitment is and how you're working on that commitment. Even older kids can understand, you know, we're struggling with this. Hmm. And we're working on it. And that way they can learn from that and take it into their own relationships later. Because if they don't, that's going to show up in their relationships down the road. That's helpful. Thanks. How would you say with um, commitment and then even like I'm thinking back to the six qualities, I think even if you don't start out a relationship like with solid commitment Mm -hmm. or those things, Mm -hmm. you can kind of, like you said, take an inventory and kind of assess like this is a growth area mm-hmm. for us. Is that something where, how's the, the healthiest way to do that? Is it having a conversation? Is it saying, hey, these are the, the strongest things, like where do we need to grow? Yeah. I think like it, it's like reality, but it's also hopeful of like, this can be improved. Yeah, I, I think it's interesting, you know, in family education, when we've uh, introduced this to hundreds and hundreds of, of families, and they've looked at the six qualities yeah. and they've kind of taken an assessment themselves. Um, they, they're they aware. They know what areas mm-hmm. that they're not doing well in, and they know what areas that they are doing well in. And I think that's the beauty of, of doing it in this way, because when you know that, that some things are going right, you're mm-hmm. much more willing to work on the things that could use some help. Yeah. I I mean, as I look at that, I'm like, okay, I can, I can tell you the ones that, and maybe it's seasonal, you know, maybe obviously I think the commitment one being right at the beginning, but now I've got, you know, kids that are getting older and testing their limits more and more. And so I'm like, oh, we haven't had a lot of crisis. You know, maybe my wife and I have dealt with crisis with our kid, like with our kids as they were going through medical stuff. But now I'm like, okay, are we going to, you know, be a family that goes through crisis together and strengthens Mm -hmm. that? And so it seems like, some of those things are, are seasonal, but a lot of it I feel like is built around just good communication, obviously, mm-hmm. even if being able to identify that and speak those things out. And so what ways does communication positively impact overall the well-being of a family? And like how, if a family's like, okay, we, we don't communicate well, uh, I think especially there's probably a lot of challenges with this, with cell phones and mm-hmm. all those things. Um, how does a family identify that? And then how do they say, okay, these are some ways we can make steps to improve our communication? I think a lot of times people think positive communication is <clears throat> saying nice things about each other and, mm-hmm. and giving compliments and that kind of thing. But it's, it's the harder things, the more difficult things that make positive communication. Like 
um, really trying to understand each other's feelings and being able to share those um, without fear that somebody's going to come down on you for it. So that's part of it. Mm -hmm. Um, Learning how to compromise, um, avoiding blaming Mm -hmm. other people for things that are going wrong. Uh, Those kinds of things are the hard parts of communication, but uh, are positive when you can get past that. Hmm. I remember taking my own marriage and family class and learning about this stuff in my counseling degree. And as much as like looking forward to having my own family and how I wanted to be healthy, it also made me a little traumatized looking back because you kind of see the family system Mm -hmm. that you grew up in Mm -hmm. and you kind of think through like, what was my life Mm -hmm. and what do I want to take forward? And so I think that for those people that don't have families yet, or maybe they're single and listening to this, it's also like, okay, if you have a family, you can assess this and move forward, but also like, what do you need to, what cycle do you need to break? Or how do you want to do things differently Mm -hmm. in your own life going forward? Yeah. Uh, I, you know, I used to joke that there were two people, two kinds of people that would take marriage and family relationships. <laughs> One was those that had great family experiences and they were so afraid they were going to mess it up mm. when yeah. they got married. And then there's those that had a terrible experience and don't want to fall into the same patterns. Mm. They want to know how to have a great family. They don't want to go through what their parents went through. Mm. And uh, so those two kinds of people were the ones that were staring at me every day, uh, trying to figure it all out. You know, I think it, it, it sounds like a given that spending time together as a family is, is good, right? Yeah. But I do think in especially the modern age with so many challenges, whether it's technology or different things that pull us apart, mm-hmm. um, what, what does that really look like and what does that mean to spend time together because yeah. I think sometimes a lot of times we're within proximity within the home, but we're not really spending time together. Yeah. Well, there's no doubt that just spending time together, you really learn about each other. And mm-hmm. so you know more about what's going on in their lives. Um, it's hard to speak into the other people's lives if you're not around them. So yeah. that's really an important part too. And, and then just having fun together and learning how to be a friend with that person that's in your family. Mm. Um, that's, that's part of spending time together. You know, researchers have always had this controversy about, is it quality time that you need or is it quantity time yeah. that you need? Mm. And basically, we say that you need quality time in great quantity. Yeah. You got to have both. And uh, if you don't have both, then um, you're probably missing out. And, and also, when we think about spending time together, I think sometimes people think it's got to be this great experience. Mm-hmm. It's got to right. be expensive. We have to, you know, plan it, you know, and all mm-hmm. this stuff. And most of the time, what people say are their best memories of being in a family are those just everyday life experiences that you get just being, you know, doing what you normally do, doing dishes together, Mm -hmm. building Mm -hmm. things together. Those are the things that people remember as their best memories of, of all of the people that we uh, used the inventory with, there wasn't one person that said, Oh, my best memory is that summer we went to Disneyland. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I want to drill down a little bit into what you said about friendship because I think there's maybe it's kind of a, a trope that, you know, parents shouldn't be friends with their children, right? Like it's kind of this, no, you're a disciplinary, you're mm-hmm. the leader and there shouldn't be this friendship connection. But I, but how has that changed and how is, you know, building those, that time, spending that time together and building those strong bonds, mm-hmm. what, what are the boundaries there that you should set? But also how do you be a good friend to your children? Yeah. Because I think for me, at least with my kids, I do, I do consider myself a friend of theirs, you know, mm-hmm. what maybe they, that's not reciprocated, but I do yeah. feel like we have a friendly connection there. Mm-hmm. Um, but like, what are some healthy boundaries with that? Well, I would say maybe not, not using the word friend, but yeah. more the word advocate, Yeah, being their advocate, knowing that you're there, that you're in their corner, mm-hmm. uh, is very comforting and, and sets that boundary that's healthy. Mm-hmm. Um, you so, know, that we, we always have this thing about who's driving the family bus. Yeah, right. It can't be the kids exactly, or you're yeah. going to have wreck. Mm-hmm. Um, but so that's a boundary. 
Mm-hmm. But you still have to let them know that that you love them and that you are in their corner. So the friendship maybe verbiage is more applicable to the spousal connection mm-hmm. than, and or older children. You yeah. know, there's a there's a time where it's it parent child, yeah. and then it kind of becomes friend friend, yeah. and it flips during certain things or or crisis times, but. Yeah. Eventually, it's going to be friend, friend. And then in the later years, maybe it goes like this, mm-hmm. where the, the child has to be the parent then yeah. of, the, of their elderly parent. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And just thinking about spending time, just to your point, even this last, it was this, even this last week, we were sitting with all our kids and we kind of asked them to reflect a lot like on their day. But I was like, what was one of your favorite things that you've done this year and we've seen family and we've like taken some fun field trips and they all were like that the weekend that we you rearranged our rooms and we like had fun like going Mm -hmm. through our toys and our clothes and it was just like that's it it's that close Mm -hmm. connection it's like it's taking that time and then it made me reflect you know when did I feel most connected to my parents Mm -hmm. or my grandparents and it was like instantly my mind goes to like picking sweet corn in a family, in a field with my grandpa, you know? And so I think it really is those moments. So if we're like feeling pressure, like how do we build this into our family? It's even reflecting on our own lives. Like when were those moments that we remember? Mm -hmm. And you're so right. It's not always, oh, Disneyland Mm -hmm. that pops up. It's Mm -hmm. those day-to-day moments Mm -hmm. that we just were normal. As as I like read this list, like one of the things that comes to my mind a little bit is like the five love languages. So I'm, this is a little bit of a, a left turn, but you know, so like my wife, one of her love languages is quality time mm-hmm. and mine is, you know, acts of service and gifts and hers is quality time and affection. And so they don't always line up, mm-hmm. you know, together. And I know like showing appreciation and affection are some of these pillars that make a strong family. So how do, <clears throat> how do those two things balance one another? Cause I also think, well, I feel appreciated. I feel loved, you know, when, you know, someone affirms it, when, you know, when they say that out loud and my wife, you know, feels loved and appreciated, literally just me being next to her, you know, like Mm -hmm. even if we're not saying anything, if we're just watching a show next to one another, it's the fact that we're doing something together, you know? So how do, how do you see love, like those love languages? I think a lot of people, especially in like, you know, a Christian, you know, society and worldview understand those and, how do they play together with yeah. with this family um, dynamic? I think love languages is a good good thing to put in here too, because a lot of times we we want to show appreciation and affection the way we want to be loved, yeah. mm-hmm. and that's not necessarily the way they want to be loved. So you have to be able to determine what it what is their love language, and I think that's a great way to start. You know when you want to show appreciation and affection. But there's lots of ways that you can show appreciation and affection. And one of the things that I found, particularly in post-communist countries, is the idea of respect, Mm -hmm. because that's something that was really difficult for them during the communist period, was feeling respect from anybody or anything. And um, that was a, a definite marker for appreciation. Hmm. Everybody wants to feel respected, yeah. even if you don't agree with them. Seems like a lot more work. Now I got fi- <laughs> like I got four kids and now I got to figure out what each of their love languages is. And I need to like meet each of those yeah. and not just mine. And so, but that, I mean, that's, I think what, you know, ultimately we want to do for a family is fight for them and fight, mm-hmm. you know, not with them, but look at those opportunities, especially in conflict and stress and strife Mm -hmm. uh, to look at those for abilities to be fighting. You know, I think you can, your outlook is like, I can either be fighting with them or fighting for them. And things go a little bit better when we decide to fight together instead of with one another. There's a couple things that everybody's going to want though, is, you know, that touch, just, just a touch on the shoulder to show Mm -hmm. that you, you care about them. Mm -hmm. Um, Hugs. I mean, even if you didn't grow up in a family that was very demonstrative and showing affection, it's important to get past that and do it anyway. Saying I love you Mm -hmm. and meaning it. Yeah. Not as an afterthought. Making that extra effort. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One of the things um, that I 
I think it's important to discuss is just dealing with stress and crisis within a family. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think for my own personal life this summer, we've, we started out doing a lot of like small home renovation things, thinking this is kind of just a light and, you know, not a big deal, but then it kind of became a big disruption, you know? Mm -hmm. And I didn't, you know, my, my son's 12, my daughter's 14. And I don't think we realized how much stress it was because it's obviously causing my wife and I stress, but you don't realize how much of it is just leeching or, you know, going on to onto them as well. Um, but then like it kept kind of amplifying and now, you know, you've got this, this sewage line that's blocked and now we're explaining to the kids, well, until we get this, you know, dug up, we can't flush toilet paper, you know, things like that. And it adds all of this stress. It seems like something, such a first world problem in so many ways, but still (laughs) it adds a lot of stress and it's this awkwardness and this uncomfortability. I mean, it's such a small example, but I think those things tend to be cumulative as it Mm -hmm. builds up Mm -hmm. and like how, I mean, what's, what's a appropriate way or a helpful way for us to navigate that as family units? Like is it, is talking about it the place to start or is it, you know, because I think sometimes there's a tendency just to go, oh, well, if we, we know what we got to do, but let's just kind of ignore it for now until we get mm-hmm. through it. Yeah, I think talking about it is one of the major things. Mm-hmm. You've got to let everybody voice their opinion about or or their, their stressors or the things that are upsetting to them um, because you don't know unless you ask them yeah. or that they say it. Um, you you know what's uncomfortable for you, but you don't know what's uncomfortable for the, everybody else. And being able to talk about, you know, things and realistically, you know, understand what's going on in their head mm-hmm. uh, and then being able to work through that. Um, not necessarily things as as mundane or something yeah. as, you, as you were talking yeah. about, but, a, you know, a real crisis where somebody's died or Mm -hmm. there's divorce looming or something like that. Mm -hmm. A lot of times what happens is people tend to try to manage it on their own individually. Uh, They, they go to a counselor, they, they Mm -hmm. confide in a friend and they forget that there's other people that are in, in this situation Mm -hmm. and they need to work on it together. Not that a counselor wouldn't be a good thing to do, but maybe, group counseling, going together, yeah. trying to figure this out together because this is a family issue. It's not just your individual issue. And what happens sometimes is when people try to manage it themselves, then they've they've gone on. They've mm-hmm. advanced where the others haven't and, mm-hmm. and families fall apart. Divorce occurs. Um, they, they tend not to want to see that person anymore because they're mad at him for whatever reason. Mm. And so really it has to be a, a family working on things together. What do you, but what do you do in that situation when they're not inevitably, but I think a lot of times there are different viewpoints in a, in a relationship or there's someone who is like maybe the strong man who's like, I don't need counseling. I'm not going to do this as a group activity or, or it could be, I mean, that could be the wife as well, but I just, I wonder, or even, even children as they be, get into their teenage years and they have opinions on these things and that's something maybe that they don't want or, or, um, they're not, they're feeling misunderstood. I mean, how do you man, that's a lot to manage. Yeah. And, and I think in, in the effort to maintain peace, you can't just put your foot down and say, well, this is what we're doing and you don't have a say. Yeah. And so like, how do you really, uh, navigate that in a, appropriate way well you have to do what is possible yeah and what isn't possible you have to let go but Mm. if only one or two people are willing to go to counseling then that what you're learning in that counseling what you're talking about on that counseling needs to be relayed to the family Mm -hmm. somehow yeah so that everybody's on the same page Mm -hmm. as much as possible Mm -hmm. yeah i think for something that really works well in our house that Ben and I have had to like struggle through because this this was not how we grew up was to um, if we start an argument in front of our kids we follow it all the way through Mm -hmm. so we let them see kind of the path that we take and that kind of creates some security and they can see resolve because you're so right kids pick up on those Mm -hmm. things and then another thing that's worked really well for me I'm sure you've seen this a lot is um, I have to manage my own triggers and my own trauma and the way that like people are affecting me and not taking that out on them. But for instance, like my nine year old, 
you know, he has an opinion now. He has his own thoughts. And so for me to allow him to talk and process through something, I have to be conscious of, okay, how how am I treating these people and being aware of other people's feelings, not just mine in the room. And I think when I step back and pause, it kind of lets me process more through like a crisis or a disagreement and then to give everyone a seat at the table, not saying like, oh, my nine-year-old is the same level as me, but I think we all deserve respect. And our Mm -hmm. rule at at our house is like, we're going to, if we're going to talk about something like it has to be like kid appropriate in the room. So I'm not saying like, okay, if we're discussing, if someone was discussing divorce or something extreme, like, Hey, involve the whole family, but it's also being conscious of who's around, who's listening, Mm -hmm. being aware. Yeah, that's good. One of one of these no shocker since I I work at a church and and I'm a pastor that perked my interest and was like yeah of course it's on there <laughs> is just the spiritual well being like how that uh, you know is is such a big part of family and uh, obviously as a church like we we believe in that we're like hey we think this was God's idea anyway uh, to build a family be fruitful multiply a lot of those things and so how does just research, how has research played it out that, you know, spiritual well-being uh, helps families and helps mm-hmm. families thrive and bond together? And and what does that, I guess, look like? How do we quantify what, I guess, spiritual well-being is? Yeah. Well, it can mean many things, uh, you know, in some ways, but, and it's not just the, there's a, there's a belief that there's a higher power of some kind. It could be shared ethical values, you know, the difference between right and wrong. And it could be um, having a compassion for other people and uh, things like uh, having hopefulness for the future. Those, everyone can get behind those kinds of spiritual well-being kinds of ideas, Um you know, uh, almost everyone would would agree with that. Um, not everyone is going to follow any kind of faith tradition, though. And mm-hmm. so, um, for a Christian family, of course, it's very important that you practice that together. Uh, and it's it's part of your everyday life. It, mm-hmm. It's not just something you put in a box and put mm-hmm. on the shelf and take down Sunday morning or when things are going well or whatever. It it's something that you um, you're you're using as a as a marker for every every part of your life. And yeah. How I mean, because you worked at a you know public institution and and things like that. So how did maybe you as a, as a follower of Jesus? How did you use this maybe not as like a, I would assume not everyone that you worked with faculty wise or student wise Mm -hmm. was a Christian, right? Right. And so how do you try to weave in like, Hey, I do think that this is Jesus's idea or God's Mm -hmm. idea in a, in a way that's non-confrontational, but also like, Hey, this is good news. And Mm -hmm. I really do think that, you know, if you meet Jesus and you follow these values and principles, because all the ones that you listed, I'm like, well, I, I think those in my opinion, are, are principles and values that God created. They were his yeah. idea. So how did you just navigate that, I guess, in decades of a career working right. in this field? Well, it's very true that not everybody that was in my class was a Christian or had any kind of faith tradition at all, um, or even those that were faith resistant. You know, I had everyone, every kind of person in my class. Um, it, there was no doubt when they left my class that they didn't know how important faith was to me. Mm-hmm. And there was opportunities for them to come and speak to me outside of class whenever they wanted to about spiritual things. You know, Christians would come in and, and sometimes they would even be a little mad at me because I wouldn't just stand up and preach mm-hmm. in front of the whole class. But, you know, if you do that kind of thing, you're going to lose half the students because they'll just shut you off right away. But if you kind of keep that door open and all the things that we've talked about and, and that I talk about in my marriage and family class are born out in research. So, you know, there, there wasn't anything they could argue with there. Um, it, if I said, well, it's true because it's in the Bible and those that don't, you know, yeah. know the Bible or read the Bible, they might have just said, not going not gonna to listen anymore. But mm. it's found in research. Mm. It's born out in research. So that was easy to do. That's cool. 
How would you suggest that families evaluate slash identify um, dynamics or qualities that are working well in their family and things that aren't? Is it going mm -hmm. back to the kind of six principles that we talked about in the beginning and communication or what would you suggest yeah. for that? Well, they, you know, when you present, I think we talked about this earlier, when you present it to them, they they already know it. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I did, I don't know if we want to talk about patterns that families get into that aren't really very healthy. Um, one of the the things that happens in a family is that they continue to do things that they've seen in their lives mm -hmm. because they don't know any better and it feels comfortable to them, even if it's not healthy. And um, so one of the things that I did in my class, and I think counselors do this, therapists do this, uh, is a gene, something called a genogram, where it's a family map and they, they map out yeah at least three generations, grandparents, parents, and, and their generation, and whoever's had an impact in their life. It could be uncles, aunts, cousins, you know, anybody in their family that has been a part of their lives, putting on the characteristics of each of that, those family members, uh, things like personality, uh, medical issues, addiction issues, um, temperament, mm -hmm. occupation. I mean, it was just like all kinds of things about each of these uh, people in their family. And then when they get that all done, they look for the patterns. Mm. What What is happening down the line that's not good, that we need to change? Mm. And unless somebody makes a conscious choice to change, it's never going to happen. You'll continue to do that. The next generation will do the same thing and on and on. Um, it's It was so eye-opening for students to be able to see it in front of them. It's like you can't deny it when it's right in front of you. Yeah. One thing that I think I saw a lot uh, was um, maybe grandpa died of cirrhosis of the liver. Dad is an alcoholic. My brother drinks too much. That's a pattern. Mm -hmm. And they've now just realized that. Oh, what am I going to do about that? I need to do something. Mm -hmm. If I don't do something, maybe it'll follow on my kids or the next generation somewhere. Mm. When you look at, I think a geneogram is a great example <clears throat> of that. And then you can kind of reflect on patterns in your own family. Um, do you have any suggestions on if someone has been in their fa obviously their family for a while or maybe married for a while and they recognize, hey, there's patterns and things that I haven't addressed yet just later, maybe later on in life. Like, is there anything that you suggest on how to start changing that pattern that they could implement into their life? Maybe mm -hmm. like starting place of that? Well, there's, they've got to start somewhere. Yeah. Um, in my marriage and family class, the last project is a problem-solving project. Mm. And it could be a personal problem, a family problem, or a societal problem. And a lot of times they would pick something that they found in their genogram to work on. And they had to come up with three solutions. And then they had to justify the solutions. It, it was a whole process that would help them to know where is the starting point. Yeah, that's really good. And then... And then you know, where, where, what's the first thing you're going to do if this is your starting point? And it was interesting. I've had many students that have come back later and said, you know, I actually did do something with that. I, I visited with my uh, in-laws. I, I, I talked to my parents. And, you know, they have to just find a place where they can start to have a conversation it doesn't necessarily mean that they have to change someone else, but maybe mm. they need to change something about how they relate to that person. Yeah. And I'm a huge fan of the genogram because I, I'm anytime I'm doing premarital counseling or things like that, I think it's so important because every family is two families merging, you know, mm -hmm. at the end of the day, you know, and so every family has their own kind of line. Maybe it's 
medical history or it's how we did punishment or how we used money. There's so many Mm -hmm. different ways where, I mean, if you don't have these conversations, I mean, it's better to have the conflict in the conversation, I think, ahead of time before it hits you in the face. And now all of a sudden you're reactive instead of being proactive about these kinds of conversations. And so I think even knowing, you know, these, these six traits is super helpful, but for someone that's maybe trying to figure out where do I start? Like we're, we're missing two of two or three of these. How does somebody begin to start this conversation? And does that maybe, does it differ regionally or differ by culture or your family culture and understanding? What's just a general, I guess, um, tip or, or thought for how do we start to chip away and mm-hmm. become a more resilient, stronger family? Well, there's definitely differences culturally. Yeah. Um, even in the U.S., regionally, there's differences. And and then uh, everybody's got differences in the way, like you said, they grew up. And understanding what are those unwritten rules that I, I, I knew were rules, but I forgot to tell my spouse mm. what those rules are. So even just starting with that, you know, what is it that you do that breaks a rule that I have? And, and that makes me mad, but I didn't recognize that before. And that, that's, a, that's an interesting place to start. But um, generally, you know, it all goes back to communication, being able to talk to each other about what's happening, what's not working, what are some things that we can do. And starting out with small little things, too, or like you said, triggers. What are those triggers? And being able to help each other with those triggers. Uh, One thing that I did did a lot of times with premarital preparation was um, find out what your fears are. And sometimes, um, just for an example, there was one time where, actually it happened more than once, but uh, someone felt uncomfortable going to their spouse's family because they felt left out. There were always things that were kind of jokes among the family members and they felt left out because they mm-hmm. didn't understand them and and they just kind of felt out of place. And and so I said, does your does your fiance know that this is uncomfortable for you? Well, I don't know. I've never said that before. Well, what could make them realize that you're feeling that way? I don't know. Well, I said, how about if you just go over and put your hand on their shoulder? Hmm. That gives you the indication, I'm feeling uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. And then maybe including them, trying to figure out a way to to make you feel more comfortable. I mean, t- so it's such little, little things that mm-hmm. can just be, you know, instant markers that change is, is needs is needed. Hmm. Speaking of premarital counseling, I just, I'm really curious to pick your brain about something. Um, since you've been doing it for so long, what do you think is something that we are missing talking about in premarital counseling? Mm. Like, well, family of origin is often yeah. left out. And I think, um, you know, being able to kind of, um, I use prepare and rich, which is in my mind, the, the, the best, the most effective, uh, program that you can use. And they use the Sir complex model, which is the couple and family map and being able to map on there where your family was and where your family was, and then talk about those differences Uh, and then look at your couple map and where you plot yourselves Mm -hmm. And what are the differences between those? That That's a great conversation. And th- it might save tons of arguments in the future because mm. you now understand where they're coming from. I, I'm sure there's tons of other things, too, that are important. Um, sharing history, you know. I think talking about the way your family did things, you know, like I'd always say, Tell me, it's Christmas morning. What are you doing? Mm-hmm. What are you doing? What are you doing? Mm-hmm. How's that going to work when you get married? Um, gift giving. Did you get one gift? Was it expensive? Did you get a card? 
I mean, it could be very different between the two and the expectations that this person has for the birthday that comes after they get married and this person mm-hmm. could be very different. Yeah. yeah. And I totally agree. I think having these proactive conversations ahead of time, like any time I've been on the backside of doing marriage counseling or doing, you know, premarital counseling, it's like, man, a lot of the, and it's fun to watch because a lot of people don't think about that. I mean, we're just so in love and love is going to <laughs> fix all. everything. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but the reality is like, it, it's fun and sometimes scary to watch couples make these decisions or mm-hmm. see like those little, like things like a holiday, like the first birthday comes around and, and they have expectations built on, Hey, well, my dad always got my mom right. this and you've never had that conversation. And then you're like, why are you not talking to me? You know, and there it just continues to right. snowball this like little thing. Like if we would have just had that conversation before, I might still be disappointed mm-hmm. because I'm used to seeing that. But at least right. I, I there's an expectation right. laid out and there's all those different things. And so much of that, I think the preparation for marriage, you know, oftentimes happens too slowly and, and we end up doing a lot of backtracking or a lot of reacting instead of being proactive yeah. with that. And so. Uh, Yeah, prepare and enrich is great. I think one other thing that I would say is um, learning how to uh, talk to each other, Mm. having that uh, get working through a conflict together and active listening, learning how to do active listening, very important. Mm. So as we start to wrap things up, is there anything you feel like you left out that you would really like to give us uh, parting words or is there resources maybe for people if they're looking for something or well, anything there, like that? There's a lot of books out there on yeah. family strengths and um, I, I <clears throat> even, even Christian books. Um, there are some, they might not all have the same six qualities, but yeah. uh, it, it's worth looking at mm-hmm. and helping. You know, I think, I don't know if I've said this, but all families have strengths just not all families are strong. Mm -hmm. So that's important to remember. Yeah. And and encouraging in some ways for somebody who's maybe thinks they're in that category. Yeah. Um, Well, uh, Sylvia, thank you for your time. Really appreciate that. Uh, And, you know, uh, also thanks for bringing producer Austin into the world and helping us out around here all the time, (laughs) you know, priceless. Uh, But yeah, this is all very good. So thank you so much. And if anyone's listening and they have any questions or concerns and they want to reach out to us, they can do that by sending us an email to podcast at cccomaha.org. Or you can reach out to us on social media on TikTok or Instagram at cccoma podcast. You can also call and leave us a voicemail at 402-885-9930. But until next time, we'll talk to you then. Bye.